Hi, everybody, and welcome to Macro Markets with Guggenheim Investments, where we invite leaders from our investment team to offer their analysis of the investment landscape and the economic outlook. I'm Jay Diamond, Head of Thought Leadership for Guggenheim Investments, and I'll be hosting today. Now, before we begin, I want to thank our listeners for tuning in and remind you that if you have any questions for our podcast guests, please email us at macromarkets at guggenheiminvestments.com. To get right into it, our topic today is private debt, a sector that has attracted a lot of interest and, more importantly, a lot of capital. There are a lot of newcomers to this space, but Guggenheim Investments has been an active participant in the market for over 20 years. In fact, we have a new white paper on the sector that will be available soon on our website. Here to tell us all about private debt is Joe McCurdy, our head of origination. Welcome, Joe, and thanks for taking the time to chat with us today. My pleasure. Thanks, Jay. To begin our discussion, let's start with some level-setting basics for our listeners, some of whom might not be as familiar with private debt. So what is private debt? How big is the market? How is it different from public debt? When we're talking about private debt. We're talking about loans originated by the holders of the debt. So at the traditional market, whether that's broadly syndicated bank debt, high-yield bonds, typically you have a bank acting as a middleman. They'll originate the transaction with the borrower, and then they'll go sell it to institutional clients. In the case of private debt, investors will go out there and originate the transactions themselves. They'll package it up the way they want, and then they'll own the risk. So a couple things happen there. You cut the fee out that the bank's going. You either capture some of that or the borrower captures some of that. And you end up pricing the risk that you want to hold versus the bank distributing to a broad array of investors. You mentioned about the size, the size of the market. One thing about private debt that you're going to learn the, the deeper you look is there's different numbers all over the place. Rough math from the numbers that we have and Prequin and other places, it's about a $1.4 trillion market. That's about the size of the broadly syndicated loan market. And to compare it to private equity, which is where a lot of this deal flow is coming from, that's about a $4.7 trillion market. So versus $1.4 for the other markets, still a lot of equity capital behind these various uh, institutional markets. Who are the typical borrowers in the private debt market, and who are the major investors and lenders? Borrowers can be oftentimes as private equity. Private equity drives uh, the bulk of the market, probably not a surprise based on where you see loan issuance of other kind of syndicated liquid products. It can be non-sponsored, which incorporates public companies, founders, family offices, others that aren't institutional or aren't true private equity firms. Major investors uh, is a broad array of institutional investors. BDCs were some of the first and probably the most headline grabbing based on a lot of those are public. But in addition to that, there's a larger array of institutional investors and they run the gamut in size. Some folks are lending to companies that are rather small, doing maybe five to 10 million of EBITDA. The average is probably out there doing deals in the 15 to 35 million of EBITDA. And then that goes higher and higher. We tend to play in the upper middle market, which would be, call it 40 plus of EBITDA. But that could be 100, 200 million of EBITDA. So pretty big companies. How are these private deals typically sourced? How are they structured? And how are they priced? Most institutions are set up similar to us where they have dedicated origination personnel. So that's a team of people out having conversations with whether it's the borrowers, the private equity firms directly. The market's evolved to a place where most private equity firms have a dedicated person or people that are out looking for debt capital for their companies. But there's also a long list of intermediaries, brokers who, unlike the investment banks, aren't going to hold any of the risk, aren't going to underwrite the risk. So they're not competing for the syndicated business. Instead, they're helping companies find investors. And so our team will go talk to that long list, although what I'd say is private equity is going to drive the vast majority of the deal flow for most direct lenders. And how are these structured and priced? How, how do they come up with the, the, the levels for, the, for each loan? Yeah, like anything else, it's a negotiation. One thing to jump into, there's a couple different flavors, right? There's first lane, uh, often referred to as Unitronch, what I would define Unitronch, which is a name you're going to hear thrown around a lot. In the, if you're spending time on this market, is it's really if you take a first lien loan plus a second lien loan, a unit tranche kind of encapsulates both of those things. A direct lender might do only first lien, they might do only second lien, they might do both, they might do unit tranche. If you go back in time, five, 10 years, and you've heard unit tranche, go you know, back then, people would do the unit tranche, they'd do the first lien loan, and they'd find a bank to finance it for them. That doesn't really happen anymore. 
or it happens quite rarely. So I, when you hear about a unit tranche, you're really talking about first lane loan. And then there's other flavors, obviously, preferred equity and other, other junior capital mechanisms that people use in the market. I think the conversation we're having, most of my comments and most of what we're doing right now, based on where we see the relative value, we're focused on first lane or unit tranche debt. What's the typical return profile for private debt, and how does it compare to other sectors of the fixed income market? It's a market we entered going back 20 years ago because the relative value versus what you could buy from the banks in the liquid market was compelling. And that relative value is defined a couple of ways. You can look at the pricing, tend to get a pricing premium for the liquidity of the loan. You tend to get a better document, so better protections as a creditor, and you get more control and more access to information. So all those add up to what for us has been good relative value versus liquid markets. What that premium is can change based on where the market is and whether that's 50 basis points, 100 basis points or, or up. The underlying loan, if you just want to say like a, what I'd call a vanilla unit tranche loan, performing company, high quality company, sponsor backed, right now you're probably getting somewhere in the range of SOFR plus 550 and a point or two, probably two points of fees up front with some call protection. So where SOFR is today, call that 11% plus with upside from amortizing the fees and call protection. And what about credit performance? Delinquencies, defaults, recoveries, what kind of protections and power do you have as a lender in private debt that you might not have in the public markets? It's hard to find great returns data. We obviously have a, a long track record, so we can look at our own or we can look at what we've at least heard from others. In general, the stats I've seen, you don't see much of a divergence from broadly syndicated loan versus private debt. You're going to get similar recovery. They're all first lien, senior secured products. Private debt, while less liquid, you can't sell out or it's harder to sell out in an in underperforming scenario. You do get some documentation benefits that can often help recovery. So covenants are probably the most widely discussed item. But remember what I said at the outset, these are loans being originated by the holders of the loans. So they actually care. Like we, as the originator of the loan that we are going to hold for the next five to seven years, we care what's in there. And we negotiate hard on the document to make sure it protects us all the ways we need to be protected, whether that's covenants or leakage or all the other things that go with that. The problem that you would run into, in our opinion, in the broadly syndicated loan market is often that the banks acting as middlemen so long as they can move the risk to a large, diverse population of institutional investors, it really turns into a sales mechanism of can they get a worse document so the borrower is happier. And so you end up with some adverse focus around who's originating the loan and who's buying the loan. So that's one of the reasons I think when you look at default rate data, you see pretty similar, if not better, on the direct lending side based on the private debt side, based on the fact that there's real protections in those documents. What's in it for the borrower? Why would a borrower choose private debt market over public debt or bank? It depends, is the, the short answer. Where the private debt market started, so we've been doing this for 20 years, where it started was deals that didn't fit. Didn't fit for the commercial banks. Maybe they're too much leverage or too complex a business or too big of a capital need for the commercial banks to fund and maybe too small for the broadly syndicated banks. And so it, there wasn't a good home for them. Or too complex to explain in a two-week roadshow to a bunch of institutional buyers. That's where it started, and that still exists. And then it's evolved such that private equity firms have gotten to a place where they are very comfortable. They like the certainty. You have certainty on price, typical broadly syndicated loan. The banks offer you one price. They have flex to widen it if it doesn't go well. Not to mention your information's out in the public domain. There's hundreds of people that are going to look at that information. You need public ratings, so you have to answer the rating agencies, and that information's out in the public domain. So timing, trying to move quickly, certainty on pricing and on capital, and then on incremental capital. You think about what we've been through over the last four years and the volatility in the markets, there's been, I think, more quarters where the broadly syndicated market's probably been effectively shut versus open. You need incremental capital to do that next acquisition. You can't necessarily tr trust the broadly syndicated market to deliver that because the banks aren't actually using their balance sheet to give you capital. They're, as I said, middlemen looking to sell down. If the market doesn't want to buy, they've got nothing to sell you. One of the attractive elements of the private debt market for borrowers is they know there's incremental capital there to grow with the business. What is it about current conditions that is making the private debt 
option so attractive right now for borrowers and for lenders? Market volatility is a great thing for private debt, right? When the market shut down, the syndicated market shut down, private debt can soak up a lot of that capacity. If you look over the last 12 years, rough math, about $100 billion a quarter is issued in the broadly syndicated market. When we see these pullbacks, and usually these pullbacks last a quarter or two, you'll see about, on average, $50 billion not get done. About $50 billion gets done versus 100 average. So that's, that's a lot of deals. That's a lot of opportunity for private debt. And in the last six quarters, we've had something like $200 billion that hasn't gotten done. That's how impacted that market has been. So you think about the pent-up demand that's out there. It's pretty exciting from a private debt perspective. But that feeds a lot of incremental volume into the private debt market. I think there's one other trend that's happening, and obviously a lot of headlines about all the capital raised in the space. What I think people fail to point out is that capital has allowed larger deals to get done in our market. You go back a handful of years ago, it took like five or six of us linking arms and working really hard and stretching to get a billion-dollar deal done. Now you can call multiple guys and they can individually do a billion-dollar deal. So the opportunity set for deal flow is much bigger than it used to be, brought in the addressable market for private debt. Do you think this is a structural, secular change in the way credit is allocated in the market? Is it going to stay or is it cyclical and it'll go back? It's been pretty steady climb for the 20 years we've been doing it. That's for sure. I see no end in sight for that. I and mean, then we have a couple of things driving that, right? Private equity continues to raise massive amounts of capital and they like availing themselves of this market. You have the banks more so than ever being unpredictable in their ability to serve the market in those pockets of volatility that leads deal flow into our market. But also it introduces us to new borrowers who say, you know what, this is not that bad. Yes, I'm paying a premium, but I can deal with one person. I don't have to do all this other stuff that comes with it. And guess what? They deliver on what they tell me they're going to do. So that trend feels like it's going to continue. And the last thing I'd say is, it just kind of makes sense. The people lending the money, originating that loan are the ones holding it. Their pricing risk that they think is appropriate for them. There's no risk in between of guessing if the market's going to be there the next day or not. So I think it just kind of makes sense longer term. Now, granted, the counter to that is when the broadly syndicated market is functioning and when that market is open, that's the cheaper place to raise capital. So yes, no doubt private equity is smart and they're economic animals. And for many of them, if it's the cheapest way to go, they are going to think hard about it, especially for the very large deals. So I, I, don't, say, I don't think that market's going away by any means, but there's a, an obvious trend that will continue to have those two coexist. So Joe, does all the capital that has been raised recently for private debt concern you? Has the increased capital meant more competition for deals? Has it affected values? We've always had competition, right? For 20 years, we've had competition. For at least the last 10, I've had people asking them the concern about all the capital being raised. Maybe there's more headlines now, but where the, the dollar sizes are bigger, so they're maybe hitting more people's radar. But this is a trend that's been happening our whole existence. So it's not new to us. You're always competing on deals. There's always reasons you have to pay attention to what others are doing. But a couple of the key trends I think that we've talked about are still there and are going to continue to be there, which is the opportunity set's grown. We can do bigger deals. The whole market can do bigger deals. That's a lot of dollars. The volatility in the liquid markets is not going away. Private equity is very comfortable with the product and increasingly so. Uh, Folks like us that also do non-sponsor transactions, that, that borrower group, yeah, I think it's actually all the headlines are actually good. That bar group now, you don't have to explain who you are or what you are anymore. People kind of get it, which opens up the opportunity of a whole new market, frankly. And right now, as you look down the barrel of the next couple of years, there's a lot of pent up M&A and deal volume kind of has to come back. There's private equity, there's LPs that need their money back in order for private equity to raise their next funds. And so we're going to see that deal volume with or without rates coming in, I think there's real motivation to to get that off the shelf. So I think there's probably two ways it can go near term. There can be volatility, which will push volume into our market, or private equity will push forward to get the pent-up M&A volume, and you've got about a year's volume sitting out there waiting to come to market. So near term, we feel good. And then longer term, I think it's a continued trend of what we've seen. And what's helped is the market's grown with it. Okay, Joe. So what is your outlook for private debt? I think the relative value of private debt is as compelling as it's ever been. 
I think the opportunity set in front of us is as good as we've ever seen it. And you can get it by taking less risk right now. We were doing this 07, 08, 09. We were doing this headed into COVID. Uh, and other pockets where the markets, when you think about where the markets have gotten strong or hot or we've been concerned in the past, think 07, low interest rate environment, very high leverage levels. The debt investor was paying for those higher valuations. That's not happening today. Interest burden on these companies is so big that leverage is kind of capped because of interest coverage. And so where, where that leaves you is you're actually lending less, at least flat, if not less leverage to these companies. The valuations have stayed the same. So like our average LTV loan to value across our portfolio is about 40%, 43%. You know, that's a lot of equity cushion in these transactions. And so we don't feel like we're wearing the risk in a market where you might argue that the V in the LTV, the valuation is inflated, but that's not really our problem. If we've got rough math, six turns of cushion, if they're two turns off on their valuation, so be it. We're still 50% loan to value. So we feel pretty good about what the risk opportunity is. I'm not going to predict where rates go, but where rates are right now, you're making double digits for first dollar risk in companies that are performing in high quality, in our case, large companies, 50, 75, 100 million of EBITDA. These are big, diverse companies that are well positioned to withstand whatever is going to get thrown at them from the economic environment perspective. What are the risks in private debt that might not be available in some of the other places? What you're giving up when you do a private debt transaction is liquidity. You're going to hold that loan. And so all the reasons I said that was a great thing, if you made a mistake, if something changes on the company, if there's a reason that you want to get out, getting out's difficult. You can try, but there's no liquid market to go sell it. Now, what I would tell you is in the liquid markets, when you want to sell, they're oftentimes not as liquid as you wish they were. <laughs> so I'm not sure how much of that liquidity premium you're really giving up or how much of that liquidity opportunity you're really giving up, but that is the big trade-off. So again, it circles back to, well, you better be right on the underwriting that you do and you better make a big investment in that team and you better have the ability to be selective in the transactions you do. So how does your team operate here at Guggenheim? How are you organized? What do you think is distinctive about the way you do it? Because now there are a lot of competitors out there in the market. Yeah. So I mentioned the origination team. We have a, a big team, big investment in our team there. I think what, what truly differentiates us and always has in our 20 plus year history across all of our asset classes, corporate credit in particular, is a big investment in our research team. We've got 60 research analysts that focus on industry verticals. And so they are experts in what they do in their industry and the other way we're, we're quite different from most of our peers is we're integrated across liquid and illiquid credit from an underwrite perspective. So what that means is our analyst who's covering pick an industry, telecom, she's looking at everything that comes in the door, high yield bond, syndicated loan, direct. She's got a team to help her get through all of that volume because that's a lot of deal volume. But it puts you in a position where when a deal comes in, you can tap into, think of all the CFOs, CEOs, data intelligence that we have from all of those different borrowers in our portfolio. Think about the trends we can see as earnings start coming out, whether monthly or quarterly in the reporting that we get. And then offensively, when we're out looking for transactions, we use that research team as a weapon there too, where we say, hey, listen, which sub-verticals of your industries do you really like? We should go find more of those deals. Or you think about the company that's kind of underfollowed, underknown, it's Broadly syndicated, but not a big deal. Not many people in it. They don't like the ratings out there. They don't like having to deal with a big lender group. We've built a relationship with that borrower, and guess what? Next thing you know, it's a private debt opportunity for us. So we think we're differentiated in that perspective. The fact that we're integrated both helps deal flow, helps underwriting, and it also helps relative value, which we think is hugely important. Many of our peers sit in product silo. So the private debt team is effectively... Maybe the same name on the company, but a different team from the broadly syndicated team, a different team from the European team. The fact that we're integrated, all that data, all of those deals, all of that work filters through the same team, same process, same investment committee, which helps us find the best relative value across asset class. Well, Joe, this has been great. I really appreciate it. It sounds like you're incredibly busy with all the deal flow you're working on. But before I let you go, you know, do you have any last words for our listeners? Private credit's been uh, obviously in the news a lot and a lot more often. I'm getting a lot more questions about it. Well, it's in the news more. It's not new. 
this is something we've been doing for 20 plus years. It's a product that we know well. And I understand why all the headlines are there. The headlines are following all the capital that's flowing to it. And the reason the capital is flowing to it is because it's fantastic relative value versus other investment opportunities. So we agree with that. We continue to see it in real time with the deals that we're doing. And we're super excited about the future because the opportunity set looks as good as we've ever seen it. Joe, thank you again for your time. It's been it's been great chatting and learning more about private debt. I hope you'll come back again and visit with us soon. And thanks to all of you who have joined us for our podcast today. If you like what you are hearing, please rate us five stars. And if you have any questions for Joe or any of our other podcast guests, please send them to macromarkets at guggenheiminvestments.com and we will do our best to answer them on a future episode or offline. I'm Jay Diamond, and we look forward to gathering again for the next episode of Macro Markets with Guggenheim Investments. In the meantime, for more of our thought leadership, visit guggenheiminvestments.com slash perspectives. So long. Important notices and disclosures. Investing involves risk, including the possible loss of principal. Private debt investments are generally considered illiquid and not quoted on any exchange, thus they're difficult to value. The process of valuing investments for which reliable market quotations are not available is based on inherent uncertainties and may not be accurate. Further, the level of discretion used by an investment manager to value private debt securities could lead to conflicts of interest. Stock markets can be volatile. Investments in securities of small and medium capitalization companies may involve greater risk of loss and more abrupt fluctuations in market price than investments in larger companies. The market value of fixed income securities will change in response to interest rate changes and market conditions, among other things. Investments in fixed income instruments are subject to the possibility that interest rates could rise, causing their value to decline. High yield securities present more liquidity and credit risk than investment grade bonds and may be subject to greater volatility. This podcast is distributed or presented for informational or educational purposes only and should not be considered a recommendation of any particular security, strategy or investment product, or as investing advice of any kind. This material is not provided in a fiduciary capacity, may not be relied upon for or in connection with the making of investment decisions, and does not constitute a solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. The content contained herein is not intended to be and should not be construed as legal or tax advice and or a legal opinion. Always consult a financial, tax and or legal professional regarding your specific situation. This podcast contains opinions of the author or speaker, but not necessarily those of Guggenheim Partners or its subsidiaries. The opinions contained herein are subject to change without notice. Forward-looking statements, estimates and certain information contained herein are based upon proprietary and non-proprietary research and other sources. Information contained herein has been obtained from sources believed to be reliable, but are not assured as to accuracy. No part of this material may be reproduced or referred to in any form without express written permission of Guggenheim Partners LLC. There is neither representation nor warranty as to the current accuracy of nor liability for decisions based on such information. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Guggenheim Investments represents the investment management businesses of Guggenheim Partners, LLC. Securities are distributed by Guggenheim Funds Distributors, LLC.